All right. Hi there. Hi, Marina. Marina, I know you. You're Bob. Bob. Just what, what about Bob? Yeah. Hi. Ariana. Nice to meet you, Ariana. And in the back. Tim. Tim. How are you, sir? Good, good, good. Hello. So, um, so there's a couple things I wanted to do. Um, uh, I want to do two sides of the board, so I'm going to use the board for you. The first side is, you know, they've got me as the director for the Cyber Center. That's here at Cal Poly. We'll talk more about that, obviously. The other hat I'm wearing is I am the interim CIO. Everybody know what a CIO is? Chief Information Officer, right? So the, the interesting part of this is that historically, these two are not connected. Um, what's interesting is in the real world, they are connected. And they're connected because this job, which does all the information technology on the campus and other places, needs to have somebody who does the cyber side as well. So it's been a very interesting learning process, at least for me, to see how this wasn't connected to this, and now we're connecting it, and we're turning over rocks going, uh-oh, 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 because there are so many things in this world, right, that, that don't necessarily match up in this world. And I think it's one of those things we have to think about as you learn and you start to reach out and see some of these things, that information technology doesn't have security as its basis for design and architecture. And, and that's a major problem. And so again, I think there, there are some interesting disconnects there. In the world that I came from, which is the commercial sector, working for the Defense Department, this and that were tied, linked very strongly together. So cybersecurity and information technology, very strong ties. Banking, very strong ties. Um, extremely strong ties in ba banking. So you see that this disconnect here at the university level is kind of an interesting process, but we see a lot more of that in California than we do other places. And there's kind of a cultural issue associated with it, just the how you do things. But so let's go back and let's talk about some of the things that are happening first in the, in the CIO world that I think you'll find interesting. So um, I'd liken the architecture that you all ride on a daily basis, the IT backbone, the architecture, is like a 1975 pickup truck. Okay. What we would hope it is, is a 19, at least 99 or later pickup truck, but it's a 1975. And so that means, anybody here know what a 75 pickup truck even looks like? All right, we got one answer. So it's, it's pretty old, flat nosed, um, suicide windows, you know, the windows that bang your head on, right? Um, and the, the back of the truck is rusted off, right? So you got, you got holes in it all over the place. You got an engine that lifts up, right? When you lift it up, there's a big old engine in the front there, but it's got none of the emission control stuff on it. It's just an engine. The challenge with that then is, is that this is 2016, and you would really hope that your, your enterprise is at least 2016. Some of you have come from high schools in the past where their learning labs, cyber labs, uh, IT labs, were way more advanced than what we have here. And that's part of the problem is that we have got to update the entire architecture across the campus. So we're looking at ways to do that, but the biggest thing that we have to worry about is Wi-Fi. How many of you plug in and use Ethernet in your classrooms? Right, nobody. You Wi-Fi, correct? And so you hope to have Wi-Fi available everywhere you go on campus. Do you? No. You wanna guess why? It's a great story. Cheaper not to? I wish that was a really the answer, but that's, that's part of the cause. But why do you think we don't have it? You're going to love this. So um, indoor and outdoor. Wi-Fi antennas, right? Indoor. Let's call this outdoor. So the indoor antennas and the way the system was designed, when they built the system for Wi-Fi, they did not take into account metallurgy and the impact on RF frequency. That's kind of an interesting comment, isn't it? So if I put a Wi-Fi drop in a room like this, and it may be metal beams all around, 
and the antenna is right next to a metal beam, how well will it propagate on the other side of the beam? Answer is not at all, right? Because it won't travel through. So it's an interesting dilemma. So again, what you're finding out is again, that you know, this, this basic non-understanding here, which is how things tie together as an architecture, what's the protection methodologies, actually ends up impacting this world as well. So design, architecture, implementation is really kind of a, a story across the board. So um, here we go, outdoor antennas. The reason why we have poor coverage here for Wi-Fi outdoors is because we only have 12 outdoor antennas set up because they have to be approved to be aesthetically pleasing to be on a facility. <laughs> have you ever seen a Wi-Fi antenna to be aesthetically pleasing? And, and oh, by the way, what the heck does that mean, right? That, that's pretty awesome. So we're working on changing that pattern right now. So at the beginning of uh, August, September timeframe last year, we did something that was really amazing, amazing, right? We actually put signs up in, in areas where there was no Wi-Fi coverage. And the reason we had to do that was because in the past, people would go through there and they would offboard on their Wi-Fi and they would say, hey, my Wi-Fi is not working and they would file a report. So we're answering all these emails about my Wi-Fi is not working. And you don't normally put location when you file a report. So what we found out was, is everybody was going through these areas where there's no Wi-Fi and filing no Wi-Fi complaints. So we put the signs up saying, hey, you're in a no Wi-Fi zone, meaning don't file a complaint here. It's really that simple. So it's amazing how simple you have to get in the design and architecture in this side to make it all work together. So we're up in the game in the Wi-Fi. One of the things that we're gonna be doing is for open house, we're actually starting up and we'll have from here on out a guest Wi-Fi. Whoa, how hard is that? Well, you wouldn't believe the answer to that question, right? Because it must have been so hard they have not done it for the last eight years. So we're going to start a guest Wi-Fi. So when your parents come or your friends come, you don't have to give them your secure Mustang wireless passwords, which you shouldn't do in the first place. Everybody doesn't, correct? Right? Right? There's no head nod over here. I'm getting worried. All right. Yeah, all right. So you, uh, let me rephrase then. Don't give out your Wi-Fi Mustang wireless password because that's cyber problem. But we'll have a password that they can log into and use it just like you're at the library or you go to a hotel, right? You have a guest account. So that's huge progress for this place. It's absolutely amazing. So we'll get to that. On the cybersecurity side, here, here's where we're at. I've been talking to the, the, this group about some cool things that we're going to do for uh, oh, six, seven, eight months. We're beyond the going to do, and we're at the do phase. So let me, let me talk about a couple of these. The first one we have is now called CCTC, California Cyber Training Complex. So this is alive and, and well. And so what this is, this is a complex that will be at Camp Slow. Everybody know where Camp Slow is? Camp Slow is about a mile and a quarter down the road on Route 1 as you're headed towards uh, Morro Bay. And so at Camp Slow, Cal Poly will be sponsoring a cyber complex to do the training of law enforcement, civil agencies, and National Guard cyber forensics. So in that capacity, what we're gonna be able to do is to say, develop training programs. And the training programs, which will be based on internet learning, uh, learning skills, continuing education skills, and other skill sets, that program will be a made available to law enforcement. Now, we've had a couple of meetings in the past with law enforcement. And, and I think uh, for those of you who have attended some of those, what you'll find out is, is they're normal people with problems that you all know how to solve. Because their understanding of technology is not where yours is. So it's a very interesting process. And when we get to the CCTC development phase, we're actually going to have you all, students, involved in some of the ex exercises, activities, and research that goes on. So in this center, I'm going to use a different pen. In this center, there is a um, academic facility. There is a cyber range and a cyber skunk works. There is a field training component. 
And then there is uh, a learning management system, LMS portal. So basically all these things have been approved to move ahead. So we are working with the California National Guard, CHP, uh, local law enforcement, and the Attorney General's office to develop all these, these entities in the academic facilities where we'll be doing actual training. Uh, we're going to try to set up a tour for you guys. So we'll set that up sometime down the road. We'll do the whole bus out there and let you see the thing. It's like we found eight classrooms to teach forensics in. It, it, it's it's amazing facility. It's, it's huge. Um, we also then will have the cyber range. So we're working with several companies and entities right now to develop a, a very large lab range. So take the cyber uh, security center that's in 192 and up that to be a range where we're plugging in pieces, parts to make it look like um, critical infrastructure, you know, make it look like um, water sewer treatment plant, not the physical look, but the network look. So you'll be able to develop the network capability that looks just like these other things. And then what do you think we're gonna do it on it, on the range? Yes. Yeah, right? Hack it, take it apart, and have those who are supposed to on a daily basis defend it. So we'll be able to play red cell against those entities. So again, we foresee in the future students being able to do that. Anybody here think they could do that? Like hack on a network and do things to it? Possibly? Yeah? Okay, good. So that's the idea with that. Field training. So here, this is going to be, this is amazingly cool. In the field training part, this is, we have a building that's a house. And in the house, we're going to set up a network. We'll have students and subject matter experts setting up this network and running it. So let's say we set up a human trafficking network, right? And so the, what the behavior, the things you're going to do is talking like, looking like you're running a human trafficking network. The law enforcement entities will practice collecting information and arresting those in the building. Now, you won't be really arrested, but they have to practice to do that so that they can actually prosecute that information in court. Nowhere in the world today is that done for law enforcement. So law enforcement does not get to practice how they collect information to take to court. So this would be a place that we can do all that. The Skunk Works is a place for research and development. So we're affording for the university for research purposes to write grants and requests to do research in the area of cyber security, be it forensics, be it critical infrastructure, doesn't matter. It's a range available for that usage. To include what we're gonna do is we're gonna take things like patrol cars and see how vulnerable they are to hacking, to information leakage, to data leakage and other things. And again, it's our intent to have students help us do all of those things. So how many of you think that a patrol car has um, security on it? Physical security? Fit. Try any kind of security. It has a door lock. That's a good answer. How about network security? <laughs> uh, None, correct. No network security on it. So all the information that leaves that vehicle could be intercepted. And then basically you guys could figure it out in about a nanosecond how to do those sorts of things. The police department, they don't have anybody to help them figure that out or how to, how to counter that or how to protect it or any of those kinds of things. So that's the kind of thing that we would be involved in. And then lastly is we're uh, right now we've opened up a learning management system. So we talked about this about a year ago. We actually have built and deployed a learning management system. So it's like Drupal. It's like uh, the system you all use for online education that we are now providing uh, the state law enforcement forensics engineers access to to exchange information, to learn how to do things, to provide training and other things. So all, all of this has started. This is actual live today. Um, this, the academic facility, they're handing the keys over to us next week. Uh, so this is just picking up and, and rolling tremendously forward. So, so this ties into the director of the Cybersecurity Center in that this becomes a model, a, a, a way to draw people in to slow, to Cal Poly, that say, hey, I do all these other things in cyber world, 
and, and I can help in the training of these entities, and I can be av available to students, and students can support this process as well. So this thing is really picking up speed. Does everybody understand, get the potential out of that? It's kind of big, like huge. So the training that'll get done here is for the entire state of California. All law enforcement available, right? Yes, sir. Do other states have like similar programs? Or other states do not. This is uh, one of the only programs like it in the nation, particularly when you add in the range, the skunk works, and the field training. So the field training doesn't exist anywhere today. So this would be the first place we'd be getting done. Could we potentially see like national like involvement? So like people like uh, like police departments flying people in from say like the East Coast? Or Correct. They're absolutely all possible. Now the coolest thing for you all for this, and this is this is hopefully this will spin your mind a little bit. So, so this is a 10-month training cycle. So you, 10 months of the year is going to be dedicated to these agencies. Two months of the year are going to be dedicated to California youth training. So we're looking to ask, say, like uh, the engineering camp during summer could be held here at the facility. M more importantly, the state of California has asked us that in 2017 and 2018 that we sponsor here at the facility the California Cyber Cup Challenge. So that's the Patriot competition, right? Done at the middle school, high school, and college level for the entire state of California championships would be held at this facility. And we would be the sponsor for that, which I think is really cool. And if you want to develop a team by then, gives you time to do that. That's part A. Part B is um, we would look to have you all help us work and support those operations. Now, also during the summer, we would have camps for other entities. So I don't know if you've heard of the Grizzly Youth Program. It's held out at uh, Camp Slow today. It's for endangered youth. And so they're, they're basically going through training there and learning how to get kind of acclimated back into to life, to really fit in and to, to fit in with a purpose. And one of the things that the Guard has asked us to do is develop an educational program that says, you know, how do you become a good cyber citizen? So we could see holding this not just for that group, but for you know, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, campgrounds. The idea is, how do you develop, how do you talk, how would you all talk to kids today about things like cyberbullying, right? Uh, about cyber responsibility, about, you know, it's too easy to go to that website, it's bad for you. But when we say it as adults, what do you all do? You go anyway, don't you? It's an evil eye. The idea is the encouragement of other youth with youth, talk on their level, work with them, interact with them, so that you know we are relating to the kids, real kids, small children and middle school children, so that we can make an impact, change how they approach things, maybe motivate them, right? So again, it's, it's a big game changer in how we do business. Any questions on that? Anybody? maybe want to do that? Sound exciting by even maybe a little? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, I think so again, this is, this is, this is not here and now. So I was at the Board of Supervisors for SLO County today uh, talking about this. We've received a grant from the state already for one of the facets of this to be developed and delivered. Um, we'll probably come to you and say, does anybody want to help put some of the equipment together and build a lab? So we're basically going to build a lab for the Slow County for cyber forensics, for law enforcement. So again, this is an opportunity to learn, to be hands-on, uh, to participate, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's really kind of cool. Now, over transitioning back over to this side, which is as the interim CIO, because there is a correlation. One of the things that we're learning is that in, in, in this world, and, and we've talked about this, in this world, one of the biggest disconnects that scares me to death is, is that the law enforcement agencies who are doing these things, their IT department came and said to me, hey, is there any way that you can teach over here how to defend and protect our own networks? So when I started asking, does everybody know what a CISO is? Chief Information Security Officer. So I started asking all the local law enforcement agencies, how many of you have a CISO? Nobody. No CISO. Nobody is doing their overarching architecture, 
security design, vulnerability assessment. They're hoping that somebody at the state level can help them one day. But right now, it's what they do by default, which is a very interesting process. The problem with that, again, is, is back to there's no security architecture designed in how they do business. So if, if you are a bad guy, right, evil, horrible person, you could hack into all their databases and get all their court cases and throw them out or destroy them before they even take them to court because they don't have the protection they need in place. So again, part of what we'll be offering here is some of what we've learned here in protecting networks and developing courseware and materials and training that goes over here to the IT departments for the police departments and help them learn how to defend their networks. Yes, sir. In terms of like IT departments, uh, like local police departments, do they set up their own networks or is those primarily set up by like some kind of state entity? So uh, most police departments set up their network in conjunction with either the city or the municipality or county they belong to. And they are lower down on the threshold and totem pole of life when it comes to getting support and resources. So most of what happened is they hire one, two people max per department. I've actually talked to a couple of police departments recently that had no IT staff and no forensic support staff. So imagine, you know, this is 2016, not having an IT person to work with. So basically, an officer who has a good idea of what to do and has, quote, played with computers is the one who puts their architecture together. That's mind boggling, isn't it? Particularly in today's world, to think of all the information they're responsible for to have really no architecture attached. But again, that's where things are catching up. Things are just trying to get there. So we're, we're taking the stuff that we learn here, all these other things, and we're helping them here. Now, what do you think is the biggest challenge that law enforcement agencies have beyond the forensics expert? So the largest challenge they have beyond just the expert for their service. What do you think? Take a guess. Biggest challenge. No guesses. Go ahead, in the back. You got one? That's your own question itself again. Well, so what's the biggest challenge law enforcement has in dealing with all this cyber forensic stuff? Experience. Experience is, is number one. Number two is bandwidth. Bandwidth. Number three is memory storage. So one telephone, because of the way that they pull down the telephone and tear it apart, and tag all the information off the telephone. One telephone, one, one 64, one of these, takes four terabytes of data to store the information off. Because everything has to be tagged as it comes off the phone. So they have to geo, they have to information tag, they have to data tag, all of that. So it, it just drives this huge file. So how many terabytes of data do you think the police department buys? Right. They don't buy data storage. That's not their thing. Their thing is to what? Protect people, right? Arrest people. So you got a whole new problem set that nobody is addressing in the community at large. So they have bandwidth and data storage requirements. So right now, you've seen it on TV, right? The, the camera that all of them have and they wear. And they, they, how much data do you think that's storing? Right, let's just say a lot, a technical term, right? A lot. The problem is how long do you have to keep it? Well, what if something happened? It's two years currently, unless something happened and then it's forever, forever. Where do you store that kind of information? And again, we're talking about an entity who doesn't buy storage as a premium. So one of the things they're looking at doing is, we'll just send it to Amazon. Wow, man. That, yeah, it hurts your head, right? So again, there's a lot of things we're learning here that just are mind boggling that you all already know is the wrong answer. That's the cool part of this. You already know that there's better ways to do these things. And so that's why, again, from our perspective, what we're pushing is once we get this going, we get you all more involved with talking about what's going on, the things you know, sharing information, because they need to know these things. Uh, we had one of the engineers talking to, who was he talking to? It was about uh, file storage. Well, basically, the, the uh, forensics engineer from Aurora Grande didn't understand file maintenance. 
And in about a 15 minute conversation with one of the white hats who explained to him file management from top to bottom, he goes, I learned more in this session than I have in the last two years. And so this is a, you know, a white hat student teaching, teaching a 30-year uh, cop forensics expert on how to do file management. Because that's not what they were trained to do when they were younger. You know, it's not the way they think. So again, you have information to help them with. So I think that's, that's pretty cool. So from the, the CIO side, um, here's the biggest lesson I've learned, okay? Pay attention to all those architecture classes. I know they're boring. Well, I shouldn't have said that, should I? I know they're not as challenging, and they don't make sense. And, and the part about designing security into the architecture is critical. Because when you don't, you get a 75 Ford pickup truck that not only barely runs, but now we have to find special ways to protect it because all the current tools don't work on it. So again, it's, it's an interesting dynamic to really get involved in. So all of this, where does it lead? All of this is experience that you can put on a resume, that you can have in your hip pocket. It's fantastic for going forward into the future market in the job world. The Skunk Works, which will be research-based, that'll be amazing. We actually will have, um, uh, the goal is to have internships, uh, a co-op type situation here as well. So there's a lot of expandability coming out of this down the road. So this will be a year and a half, two years, and this will really be kicking up for that. So that, that's really cool. On this side, um, we hire a significant number of students in the IT departments. I don't know if you knew that or not, but we have about uh, 55 students that work part-time for us in IT. So if you're interested in working in IT, just let me know. Uh, and we'll find out what the status is on, on hiring and students in that area. And if you're too busy to work, don't. But if you want experience in the IT realm, because that's what you're kind of doing, call me and let me know, because I don't think everybody knows that these opportunities are out there. Matter of fact, we have, um, we have a, a new hire that we've just brought in in the security group that was a student a year and a half ago, and he was a interim for a while, John Wiley. And so John now works for us in the security area. So there's a lot of opportunity to get paid for kind of what you're doing before you get out and go and those kinds of things. And then the last thing I want to talk about is uh, the project that we're doing, which is the case study library. Uh, and the case study library, I'm sure you've heard about it. Yes? All yeses? No? All right. So basically what we're doing right now is this. How many of you have tried to explain cybersecurity to your parents? And how did it go? I'd really love to know. Not fun? It blew up? Is that, is that what I heard? Just like went over their head? Yeah. Yeah. How about, how about you? Yeah. It, over their head, didn't understand, no and they all got worried, right? No way to worry. Whoa. <laughs> See that? that OK, um, we'll stop there. So here, here, here's the problem. Right? If you think about it, if you think about it, right now, you all get it. You get it because in, in this group and in other social settings, as well as in, in your classroom, you're, you're being told how certain things operate. How easy is it to get into somebody's uh, camera on their laptop? Hard, medium, or impossible? Or not hard? Anybody ever tried it? OK, good. Never mind. Um, Let's just say it's, an, it's, it's possible, right? Um, and from possible, you get very worried. So the key becomes, how do I explain a cyber incident to somebody in ag, right, in the agricultural department? What do they think about it? Whose problem is it, first of all? Is it their problem? Somebody else's. Who are they going to say should fix it? IT. This is where it gets really crazy. Well, IT guys should take care of that. And you're, wait a minute, this is a password problem set. Or you linked into, or you, you uh, my favorite daily subject, you know what phishing is, of course, right? You know how many instructors or professors here still accept phishing emails? <laughs> Don't want to test, it's, a, it, 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 it's great, why? Why? Why do they do this to me? They don't do it on person, on purpose, but they do it because they don't understand the architecture. 
they still think security is there to prevent them from having fun and doing the things they need to do. So um, I don't know if you saw recently, we've been fished the last, this, this week, uh, we were turning away 3,000 phishing attacks hourly. Yes, sir. That's that capital E thing, right? Without the L, that like... yeah. the, the the phishing email that went out yesterday. Yes. Yeah. Right. And there, the the um, it's a smart email as well, so it adapts. It'll come back at you a second time and change the subject and the title on the second time. Um, what was interesting was we had an individual hit it. It read the global address off the hit, and it started resending out phishing attacks to individuals labeled by their address. That's all it took was one phishing connection. Now you all know how that works? Yes? You had the class on phishing. It basically it opens a portal and allows it in, and it, then it goes to the root, and it pulls the directory root out and starts reading email addresses. So then basically what it does is it starts sending emails out of that directory so that instead of getting one that says, um, dear customer, it now says, dear Bob. And so you think it's addressed to you because it's got your name and it's got your email address. It's got your first name on it. But that's because it's read the directory and now it's sending it directly to you. So again, what we see is, is that there is a disconnect. The case study library, the idea of the case study library is to have one engineering student and one non-engineering student work collectively together to write a case study analysis, which is basically to take a cyber incident and to translate it into non-technical, non-engineering, and how it applies to that other student's area of study, such as ag, or economics, or political science, and make a relevance in that that doesn't exist today. So why are we doing this? What's, what's the goal behind this? The goal behind this is, is that we all get it. We understand it. When you tried to explain it to your parents, they look at you with those glassy eyes and their, their eyes roll back in their head and they, they go, wow, I'm so glad I'm sending you to school to protect me. Right? Do you, do you, have you heard that one? I mean, I, I've heard it. I'm glad you're protecting me. And you say, I can't protect you. You have to learn to do certain basic things on your own. Right? And if they can't understand it, they're not going to learn it on their own. So the goal is to find a way to better teach non-engineers about cybersecurity. And so the case study library is to develop case study-based learning to generate an entire library of these things. Now, uh, anybody here familiar with um, the iFixit guys and you know the conversation they had about tractors and tractor management? Right? So you understand that a tractor has a GPS in it, global positioning system, and that the GPS in the tractor sends information back home to the tractor manufacturer of where your tractor has been. Kind of like a study I think I heard earlier about cars. So that information that they send home about your tractor and the way it's behaving, what does that tell the manufacturer? What's in that information? Is it your crop? Yes. Is it your crop rotation? Yes. Is it how you plow and do all these things? Yes. And so that information is really about you and your stuff. And the question is, is, do you really want that going back to somebody else? The answer is probably no. But, but if the ag, if the driver of the tractor doesn't understand that, how are you going to explain it to them? So that's what the case study library is supposed to do. It's supposed to help explain in non-engineering terms what just happened to them. So we'll be coming back to you all for more of those. We're doing, how many is it now? We're doing four, proto, four, four case studies right now. And the idea is to generate and populate an entire library of these case studies. And for you all to get credit for publishing, to get credit, and the goal is to have uh, stipends available for publishing so that you'll receive a cash reward for having published. It goes into a library so that other entities, other people, can use that library in a classroom setting and learn and gain from that experience. So it's pretty cool. All right, so my world here has changed significantly, and, and Nate will tell you that the, when I started, this was a conversation about, gee, wouldn't it be cool? We're well beyond wouldn't it be cool to holy crap, it's really cool because it's real. Right? So we changed the terminology. This is amazing. My security background drives me nuts every day because of this, but it's because that security architecture wasn't built into the system. 
So, so the biggest message out of here is, is as you go forward into the world and you start seeing how much of the security architecture has not been built in or wrapped in up front, it will scare you even more, even more. So we're, we're doing things to change that here, but we're trying to do it so that it's non-observable, right? Simple things like the, the guest Wi-Fi. Now, is that about security? No, it's about pulling people off the other part, which is if you have a friend come to visit you and they want to use the internet and they say to you, I can't get into the internet. There's no guest. Can I have your password? Now you got to make a decision, don't you? Do I give up my password, which I know isn't right to do. And it's a cyber, really, it's a cyber risk. It's a risk for me. Or do I have them complain that they can't get on the Wi-Fi? Well, most of the time students give up their password. It's just kind of a natural thing for them to do. It's wrong, but it's what happens. So the idea is take that off the table by providing the right kind of service with a guest Wi-Fi. So bottom line on that, not always is security doing saying no the right answer. Sometimes it's getting other elements to step up to provide services that security now doesn't have to worry about. Does that make sense? So that's kind of everything that we're doing. Um, I'll wrap up here unless you have questions and I'll be glad to talk about anything you want to ask from the world of security, either this side, that side, or the real world. Anything burning a hole? Yes, sir. The range of kind of infrastructure are we talking about? Like, like what are we going to be um, emulating? So everything from, thank you very much, everything from critical infrastructure to a network to a home system, right? So it'll be very, very fluid, functional. Um, several servers will roll in, several de personal devices roll in. So picture, if you will, like this classroom here, each desk represents a different component and you move them all around and you build another architecture. So basically we're designing the architecture du jour that would be used for that operation. So new power plant, water filter station, um, electrical company, uh, your home. <laughs> Not that I'd really do that, right? But, you know, it's those kinds of things that we would be doing and emulating those. And you know, this can be designed by professionals from that field. So like, we'll get from PG&E from design. They Correct. To work. Absolutely right. They are participating and supporting the design. Also, what we've done is, is we're, I was just saying today, we, we've hired this guy, we call him the mad scientist from this world. Um, he's been designing architectural networks for simulators for years. So he builds both defense networks as well as commercial networks, and he emulates on a simulator those networks. So that's a very, very useful resource because that means he understands all of those nodes. Now, the fun part of this conversation is, is that when it comes down to designing the architecture, there's really basically a handful of different nodes that are utilized. So there's PCLs, PLCs, programmable logic controllers, uh, HMI interfaces. Those are the two touch points in a network for critical infrastructure. There are certain components to the far use end that are different based upon the architecture we're talking about, but they still have to talk to those two elements. And those are by far the two weakest links in the entire system. 90% of the action is against those two things. The 100% of the action is usually email against the individual. You know what the success rate for phishing is, by the way? It's like 96% success. So if they have a phishing attack, there's like a 96% rate that somebody's going to hit it. I, I'm here to say they're really close to the right number because somebody always, always, always hits that phishing, no matter how much educating you do. Other questions? Was this helpful? Yes? I just wondered the problem with the public network about the password used to do critical student things like I know, adding or like dropping classes. Something that would like really mess you up with someone without that absolutely correct. Um, and that's one of the things we're trying to work on is, is that um, we have single sign on here and um, everybody's glad of that. I'm not because of the security implications, right? You give up your password one time, how many other things are now available with that password because of the single sign-on? So again, if you, if you gave out your password or you wrote it down and gave it to somebody and then somebody else picked it up, 
They could literally go in as you and make all the changes to your stuff and other stuff as well. And, and we've seen that not all the systems are well protected. So we got a lot of work to do. A lot of work to do. We'll get there one day, year, century, millennium, one of those. Other questions? So yeah, I guess you're going to go out of here and go home and do your homework, huh? Something like that. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, lots more to come. Lots more to happen. Um, stay in touch. I'll, I'll keep Nate very much involved and in tune in what's going on. Um, as we go down the road on the case study stuff, you might want to take a look at it. Just because you'd be surprised how little non-engineering students understand this problem. I, I think I deal with that issue every day, 10 times a day. That they don't understand, well, why is it important to protect my password? Really simple stuff. All right. All right, I'm done. Thank you very much.